Hello everyone, today on the Van Maren Show we're going to be taking a look at the documentary aka Jane Roe which made some stunning claims recently including the idea that Norma McCorvey or Jane Roe Roe v. Wade was actually paid to join the pro-life movement and that her change of heart was fake. We talked to her actual friends, people who knew her for decades to get the real story on what Norma McCorvey was actually like. That's coming right up. Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Van Maren and welcome back to the Van Maren Show. As those of you who uh, might have read a couple of my previous columns will already know, uh, the AKA Jane Roe documentary, which was released by uh, FX Hulu on May uh, 23rd, basically made the case that Jane Roe Roe v. Wade or Norma McCorvey did not actually convert to the pro-life movement. She was paid to join the pro-life movement. Now, some of you might be familiar with Norma McCorvey's story. Uh, When she was a, a young woman, she was poor, pregnant, living in Texas, looking for an abortion. And she was approached by two lawyers, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, who were looking for a poor pregnant woman to challenge the Texas abortion law. That was challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court, where on uh, January 22, 1973, the Roe v. Wade case was decided, making abortion legal in the first trimester in all 50 states. And America, of course, has been battling over the Roe decision ever since. And that transformed Norma McCorvey into Jane Roe of Roe. Roe v. Wade. And at first she was on the pro-choice side of the question, although she often confessed to feeling very used by the pro-choice movement. She did manage to connect with a lawyer named Gloria Alred, who would arrange interviews and speaking engagements for her as Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. Uh, And actually it was during one of those interviews where Norma McCorvey admitted that she had not actually uh, been raped. Uh, which is a claim she had made when she was first approached by Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey. That led the pro-choice movement to see her as a volatile and unreliable spokesperson. And Norma McCorvey became disillusioned with a lot of people inside the pro-choice movement. She felt like they had sort of brushed her aside. And she went to work for an abortion clinic in Dallas, along with her longtime lesbian partner, Connie Gonzalez, and Operation Rescue, which was then run by, by Flip Benham, moved in next door. And through conversations with Flip Benham and other pro-lifers, Norma McCorvey actually uh, became pro-life. She left the abortion industry. She joined the pro-life movement. She was baptized in Flip Benham's backyard for the cameras and eventually converted to Catholicism in 1998 under the guidance of Father Edward Robinson And Father Frank Pavone of Priest for Life, Uh, Father Frank Pavone has been on this podcast in the past, as those of you who follow along will know. And Norma McCorvey was also always known as as a bit of a volatile figure. She had a very difficult life. She was uh, beaten by her husband, who she married at age 16. She was sexually abused by, by a relative. She was pregnant three times out of wedlock by her early 20s. She dealt drugs and was sent to reform school. She was a drug user. She had a very, very difficult life, and she was first and foremost a survivor. But in the pro-life movement, she found the family she'd always been denied. I've written a couple of articles interviewing a number of her friends, one for Christianity Today, another one for the American Conservative. You can find those at thebridgehead.ca if you're interested. But for today's episode of the Van Maren Show, I really wanted to just interview a couple of her friends so that they could share uh, their memories about Norma McCorvey with you. Because Norma McCorvey was not what the documentary claims she was. And in fact, the documentary does not even say what all the headlines say she said. Pardon, pardon, uh, pardon me for the tongue twister there. One of the, I think Nick Sweeney, who's the producer, I think that his greatest success here is, is that he managed to get the entire media to buy into the idea that she was lying about her conversion, that she was paid to convert. That's not what the documentary says. That's not what Norma McCorvey says. I think that horse is probably out of the barn, uh, that Nick Sweeney has won his PR battle to lay claim to the legacy of Norma McCorvey, at least in regards to the question of payment, because there was also, as one of my upcoming guests will mention, a, a, a former pro-lifer uh, who, who went on the documentary and, and obediently trashed all of his friends uh, for Nick Sweeney. So I'm going to talk to four of, of uh, 
Norma McCorvey's friends coming up here. I'm going to talk to Lynn Mills. Uh, she's been on the podcast before because she's a, a pro-life activist from Michigan who's done a lot of uh, undercover research on abortion clinics and is most famous actually for having shut down Dr. Death, Dr. Jack Kevorkian. She actually has an actress play her in the HBO movie You Don't Know Jack about Dr. Jack Kevorkian. It was her research on fishing files out of a garbage can that led to his arrest. Then I'll be talking to her longtime friend Karen Garnett, a pro-life activist from Texas who knew her for 20 22 years. I'll then be speaking with Troy Newman of Operation Rescue. Again, I've had him on the podcast before to discuss his work shutting down abortion clinics. He knew her for years and years, and she actually lived with his family near Wichita, Kansas for a time. And then I'll be talking to Patrick Mahoney, who was a member of Operation Rescue back in the late 80s and early 90s. He's a pastor and a pro-life activist well-known to everybody in the movement. He's one of those pro-life activists who just seems to have showed up everywhere. And so he also was friends with Norma McCorvey and joins me to discuss her legacy. So this is just a show where a few of Norma McCorvey's friends share their memories of the real Norma McCorvey and rebut what the documentary purports to show about AKA Jane Rowe. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, Lynn, uh, to start off, um, when did you meet Norma McCorvey? I met Norma McCorvey at Joe Scheidler's trial, Now versus Scheidler, mm. in Chicago. And I had been um, requested ordered to testify on Joe's behalf because I had uh, done a many rescues and you know it was the feminist against Joe and I was a woman who who organized rescues and when I heard Norma was coming the next day to testify on to testify for Joe right I said oh can I stay an extra day and meet her I was so excited and Norma and I became fast friends. I wanted to hear all about what she had done while working at the abortion mills. And she said, forget that. I want to hear all about your work with Dr. Death. And so we just right. sat, there. We sat there in a bar in the hotel, uh, Norma, Connie, and I drinking, sharing stories. And back then, I can't remember if it was 97 or early 98, um, we just had a great time. We became fast friends, and there was no, no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was email, and that's how we communicated. So, you know, we just kept up kind of like a pen pal type situation via email, and, you know, stories came out, and she told me about, you know, her conversion her road to Catholicism. And for those people who think she took RCIA, she did not. She had private instructions with father. And I can't remember father's name. Edward Robinson. Thank you. And, you know, she would just tell me about her stories and how much she loved him. She loved him with all of her heart. And it came around to... I said one day, do you have a sponsor? Do you have a, a godmother? And she said, well, no. She goes, do you want to be mine? And I didn't miss a beat. I said, yes, I'd love to be your sponsor coming into the church. And we booked me a flight and I went down there. She picked me up at the airport. And when I got to their home on Cactus Lane, Miss Connie, you can't see me, but I my hands are imitating this huge, huge um, margarita uh, uh, glass. And we sat around in their house telling stories, having absolutely wonderful time. She then took me over to the Priory where Father Robinson was. We had soup and bread. We, you know, spent time with Father and then another woman by the name of Monica Ashour. We met with her and we worked on the um, prayers of the faithful for the next day. And it was just so memorable being with her. 
sharing that experience. And, you know, I can go on. I mean, you're the interviewer. What else do you <laughs> want me to, Because there have been many experiences over. Yeah. Well, and this this show is going to air close to a week after uh, after the documentary. Now, finally, finally did air. And my reaction to the documentary once I watched it was that producer Nick Sweeney's greatest accomplishment was basically getting the entire media uh, to pick up his his narrative of that she got paid to change her mind before this thing came out because that that's not actually even in in the documentary. I wrote that in in, in the American Conservative. What was your re- have you seen the documentary yourself yet? What what was your like? Because you knew her, you knew her personally. Um, you know, everybody in the pro life movement kind of knows each other. But like you said, you were her godmother, and you actually you actually knew her, and you were actually friends with her. What was your reaction to seeing the documentary in the context of of your long friendship with her? Um, is I I would like to have seen the questions they asked her. Yes, and they they didn't put that out there. And my opinion of the documentary is. Um, they can have Reverend Schneck if Shank. Yeah. Um, that they couldn't have done that without him, that this documentary was filmed over many months, perhaps a year. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what was going on in Norma's life. She she did say words. Words have meanings. Um, over the last few days, Norma's taken priority in my brain over my children, and that's hard to do. I mean, but she is my godchild, and I don't know what was going on. And we in the pro life movement are loving Christians, and we would have loved her no matter what. And I didn't realize or understand how much the pro boards hurt over losing her and how desperately they wanted her back and at what lengths they're going to go to to get her back even when she's dead i'm i'm just really confused over the whole thing and no matter what no matter what norma would have done we would have loved her unconditionally anyway. So, um, Jonathan, I think we're going to have more unanswered questions than we're ever going to get the answers to. Right. And in the end, does it really matter? Would we have treated Norma any differently? No. If we knew she was pulling a stunt. So, does it matter? If in the end she's going out and saying blank to all of you, look at the good she really did. Yeah. Do you put your name to a piece of paper? Do you try to reverse row? In the like, Norma got mad at me at some point. I have no idea what I did. So for the last eight years, Norma didn't talk to me. I have no idea what I did. When I got on Facebook, and we were friends on Facebook, I saw Christians go at Norma for things Norma was doing. People wouldn't accept Norma for what Norma was, just like the pro boards wouldn't accept Norma for what she was. People kept trying to change Norma. And when you say people kept on trying to change her, just for people who aren't familiar with her story at all, um, let's say people who are pro-life but not not really part of the pro-life movement. Who was Norma McCoy? How would you describe her? Rough and tumble, um, genuine, and very rough around the edges. But when you got to know her, she was funny. She was fun. She spoke her mind. She didn't give two rats. And I'm I'm trying to be polite in Norma speak about what you thought of her. Norma desperately wanted to be loved. She wanted to be accepted. And after watching uh, the documentary, you can really see how that goes back to her being a very little girl Mm -hmm. and her relationship with her mother. 
and everything, you know, that we all want love. We all want acceptance. And with Norma, that ran really, really deep. And when she didn't get it from the parole boards, maybe that was reason enough for her to convert to a her life. I don't know. But her relationship with Christ was genuine. You can't fake Jesus, Jonathan. You just can't fake that. And you, so I don't know where, where to take it from there. What was when you, you're so you so you've seen the documentary you've you've read a bunch of the articles and the reviews that have come out I guess and my final question that I wanted to get from you is what what is one memory one conversation one experience you had with her um, that really sticks out in your mind everybody has you know certain memories about their friends that really stand out what is that for you about Norma so listen to this she had me they she was invited to a birth control convention in Chicago and she told them she wouldn't go unless they had me come and we're sitting around a table and on the menu was baby veal veal she would not she cared so much about not eating veal just that stuck in my head she couldn't eat a baby cow hmm. that wow yeah I mean think about that. She was just so offended by that. So offended by veal. Well, Jason Jones said after watching the documentary, he said, I was afraid that this documentary was going to be a hit job on the pro-life movement, but actually they did a hit job on Norma. They tried to make her look, um, in, in order to get her back, as you put it, they just, they tried to make her look duplicitous. They tried to make her look like she didn't believe what she'd said she believed. Um, I think they did her more of a disservice than they did the pro-life movement actually. And, I, you know, well, from what I've seen on the pro-abort websites, they were going to use this to take us down. I don't, I don't know how they can do that. I mean, we have life on our side. We have Christ. We're on Christ's side. And we still, in the end, love Norma. And we always will. You, you can't fake 23 years. And we don't know what was going on with Norma. In the end, she probably was very angry at a lot of people. And if we weren't recording, I'd tell you a few other things. But we're mm -hmm. recording, Jonathan. And, you know, there are some things that will remain private. Mm -hmm. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate this. Thank you for asking me. All right. For the first question is, how did you how did you meet Norma? You were friends with her for 22 years. How did that friendship start? So I became involved in the pro-life movement here in Dallas back in 1989 and started praying outside the Dallas abortion facilities in in early 1990. And I was I became acquainted with Flip Benham, who was the leader of Operation Rescue. I would go out every the second Saturday of every month. And whenever our bishop was leading the rosary and, and Flip would be alongside with his Bible, ready to share the word after the rosary was finished. And in 1995, it was news for all of us um, that Operation Rescue had moved in next door to the abortion facility where Norman McCorvey was working. And literally within, it seemed like days, but probably within weeks, for sure by um, July of 1995, Norma had accepted uh, the invitation to go to church from the, a little girl, seven-year-old girl, Emily Mackey, the daughter of Rhonda Mackey, who was one of the volunteers daily at the Operation Rescue Office. To go to church, she gave her heart to Christ, and as everyone knows, um, the famous baptism of Norma in the pool, August 8, 1995, that was when her conversion to Christianity became very public. So I was working here in the pro-life movement. Um, officially working since 93. Over those first few years, 1995 to 1998, we interacted mostly just on, um, you know, we'd see her at events and things like that. She was close with Rhonda Mackey at Operation Rescue. It was in 1998, August 17th of 1998, when Norma was confirmed into the Catholic Church, and I'm Catholic. I was the right. executive director of the Catholic Pro-Life Committee here in Dallas, and Norma had 
had, Norma and Connie had um, gone, been going weekly to what they would call, Norma would call the catechism lessons with Father Edwin, Edward Robinson. He, a um, very saintly man, he's who we fondly, affectionately would call the, the patriarch of the pro-life movement in Dallas. He right. was appointed as the diocesan pro-life coordinator back in 1974, a year after Roe v. Wade. And by the time Norma converted, um, he was 81 years old. He was already elderly. Oh, I had no idea he was that old. Wow. When Norma, when Norma converted, he was born in 1914. So when she converted right. to Christianity, he was 81. And she would go, uh, she was very interested, became very interested in the Catholic faith. And um, so it was a very joyous occasion on August 17th of 1998 when Father Frank Pavone, he was working in Rome at the time, flew in from Dallas. And I and my small children, uh, we went to her her confirmation in the Catholic Church, and Father Frank confirmed her and was the homilist at the Mass, and Father Robinson gave her her First Communion. I Then, after that, um, Norma and I became closer partially because we were, ca- we were sharing the Catholic faith together, and she would be coming to more of the, the Catholic events. It was um, in coming up to the year 2000 when I was pregnant with my fifth child and decided to go to the March for Life for the very first time. And I'm pretty sure Norma was speaking briefly at that March that year, but we made that a trip together. And it was um, really fun because I was pregnant and Norma was, we, we kind of started calling each other. Norma, Norma loved to give people nicknames. Mm. And, and so our nickname with each other was just, um, we call each other WSW, which was the acronym for Wild Sister Woman, okay? Right. Yeah. For someone like me, he's very conservative, you know, mother of five. I'm, I wouldn't, no one would ever like classify me as wild. So it was very much just fun, something fun for Norma and me. But we really did kind of share a sisterhood. And she kind of adopted me. This was my first March for Life. And so everywhere we went, we went together. And Norma would jokingly say, she's with me. She would, this is a complete joke, but we're pregnant, right? So she's taking care of me. And uh, that was really just a lot of fun and really special to share that with her. And um, then a few months later, she was um, very excited about the birth of my, my fifth child. And she and Connie actually came to the hospital. This was, I was, went to the hospital. He was born at 1030 at night on a Thursday. And she came, I actually have a picture. She, she brought me a giant life-size rosary and she and Connie were praying outside of my hospital room when I was having my fifth child. And, and then she, I've got this picture as well. She was one of the very first people to hold him after he, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then here's one more picture. There she is holding him at his baptism a, a month later. So those were really very, very special memories in those, in those early years, right. the eight to 2000. So one one of the things I wanted to ask you because so so people who knew Norma were not surprised by the way she talked on in the documentary by the rough around the edges uh, sort of way she communicated. But I know uh, let's say people who are pro life but not part of the pro life movement or people who didn't know her, um, they're kind of sort of shocked by that. But that's what Norma was like, uh, especially based on all the people I've talked to over the last last week or so. Could you just tell our, our viewers and our listeners what was Norma like as a person so they, they get a sense of how not shocking that part of the documentary actually was? Right. So Norma was very complicated, and um, I, I described her to you already in, a, in, a, in another article about complicated and, and fragile. Um, Norma had very serious health issues, you know, a number of types of health issues, and um, and I think she had a really, really, really rough life. Mm-hmm. Undo the wounds and, and the things that you, you know, that, that had formed you, the way that you had lived in a sort of overnight just because you have a conversion. So there, yeah, there would be times. Now, not always. I, I, I want to I go back briefly to the, the Father Robinson relationship with her. That was such a precious relationship to witness because 
Norma's dad had left her mom, you know, when she was young and she really didn't have a father. Father Robinson was elderly and saintly and, and they had this beautiful, what I would call a daddy daughter relationship, you know, spiritual father, spiritual daughter. And to watch them interact uh, was just, it was so heartwarming. So clearly whenever Norma was around Father Robinson or even for the most part, our interactions, um, she didn't talk like a sailor, right? But when she, when she would get ticked off, which she had that temperament up and down, um, you could, she just let it go. And, and that happened all the way through, um, really through her life. That didn't change entirely. So yeah, that's, that's Norma. Norma would, she would be kind of on again, off again. She'd be, she'd be fine. And then she'd get ticked off about something and then she'd start, you know, cussing about this or that, or this person who made her mad. Um, I wasn't on the receiving end of that personally, but yeah, I definitely would hear her at times, um, you know, cuss. So one of the things I wanted to bring up, and you and I have talked about this already for, for a couple of articles I wrote on this when the, when the documentary first came out, is this idea that uh, not that she was used, but that she was paid to become pro-life. And interestingly enough, when I watched the documentary on Friday night, it's weird to say, but I was almost relieved because I thought, okay, maybe they're just, they're, they're saying, they're saying something, but they've got another long interview where she says that she was bribed or something like that. But it was just a well edited nothing burger, basically. Like they their their evidence that she was bribed was a nine ninety form showing donations to Row No More Ministries. The idea that a donation to a pro life organization is a bribe is, is is almost farcical. And the reason I want to bring that up with you is because you very specifically were part of a conversation where uh the pro life organization you worked for decided to donate to Row No More Ministries. So you were directly involved in in supplying the financial aid to her organization that the the documentary is portraying as bribes. Yeah, I mean, I'm dumbfounded by that, even the possibility that, first of all, I can't imagine Norma taking that position. I am going to make this decision to become pro-life just to be paid to be pro-life, and it's all an act. Just impossible, impossible for the Norma we knew. Right, right. And as I mentioned, she had serious health issues. And again, Father Robinson, she had, she had begun joining a speaker's bureau after she left the abortion industry and she was volunteering with Operation Rescue. She did need, you know, she needed to live. She needed funds to live on. So she had, be, she had joined a speaker's bureau and begun going out speaking. And obviously everybody who goes out speaking, they get honorary, you know, an honorary when they, mm-hmm. um, yeah. but it was causing Norma tremendous stress and she had issues with anxiety and it was actually it was father robinson again uh, he was on the board of directors of the catholic pro life committee and i was the executive director and he came to our board meeting and i can't remember the year but i'm thinking it was really it was pretty early 99 2000 and he said um you know norma's health is really suffering with all of this traveling and it's 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 not going to be something she, she can keep up with could we, he actually asked and recommended, could we, we donate to several other her life organizations, pregnancy center here in town. Could we add Row No More Ministry as a line item in our, in our monthly budget? And the, mm-hmm. the, the vote was yes. And so we did that. That was to basically, it was to Row No More Ministry and it was to help Norma keep her office open because she could still do a lot of correspondence and work, you know, the internet. Um, she could give interviews from her office where she wasn't actually having to get on the road. So it was our decision and we were very happy to do that because we love Norma. As soon as she converted, she was a member of the the pro-life community, the pro-life family. Again, we considered each other sisters, you know, and, um, but her health would not allow her to be able to go, go out and and continue to do that with the, the strain that was on her. And, and then, you know, even Norma moved away for several years, and when she was ready to come back to Dallas, she, this was fall of 2012, um, she just called one day and said, you know, I'm ready to move back. Can you help me find a place to live? And again, it was going to be, there needed to be someone who would be willing to take Norma in um, mm-hmm. and provide 
you know, loving care and hospitality for someone who honestly could not fully support herself, you know? Right. That was, um, that was a beautiful, beautiful thing again, where it was just, we had a, a widow here in the pro-life community who had an extra room in her home and she, she received Norma. Norma lived with her for three years. And this is with Norma's health, COPD, emphysema, declining, in and out of the hospital, um, all of that. That was, that was all part of our love and care for Norma. So no, mm. Norma's being paid to act, to be pro-life, it, uh, to me, impossible. Well, well. Yeah, and, and and the line that it was an all, it was all an act when she said that, that they paid me and then I, I went out in front of the cameras and and, and trotted out lines, which she always did. I am row row no more. Like she had these things that she said, um, but it was interesting on the documentary to realize that he put those words into her mouth. He said, like, would it be fair to say that it was all an act? Um, but the all suddenly encompassed her whole career as opposed to just the things she did in front of the camera. So. I, like I said, I actually felt somewhat relieved watching the film. I'm like, oh, that's all he has. Um, this is a sort of a really, really feeble case. Now, I wanted to ask you this because we talked about this previously. Uh, the context for when Nick Sweeney actually shows up in her life, I think, is very, very interesting. So he shows up around 2016. Norma had been in and out of the hospital something like 11 times at that point already. Tell us a little bit about what you know about Nick Sweeney showing up, taking her out of the hospice. Right. I honestly... I, I was not aware. Um, Norma had gone into the hospital the last time here, here in Dallas and right around just, just before Christmas of 2015 and her, her doctor, again, even, even the doctor who was caring for her was a member of the pro-life community, Mm -hmm. adopted uh, Norma as his patient. And at that point he's, you know, she had exactly right. She'd been in and out of the hospital so many times, even here in Dallas before she was moving down to, to Katie for the, her, her final year. And he had said at that point, she likely needed to go into a care, you know, a care facility. Uh, it would not be workable for her to either stay here in the home where she'd been living or even to live in her daughter's home. So that's when the, that decision was made. The, the person who had been um, having her live with her let, reached out to me and to, and to her daughter to say, it, it's time for, you know, a change. And, so we, we, we met together in the hospital there, New Year's Day. Um, I wanted to make sure her daughter knew that as, as she left us, we were still, we were, you know, our hearts were going with her, my phone number, I mean, available for anything, anything she may need support-wise. And also made a contact with a colleague, in, a pro-life colleague in Houston to re- make the handoff, receive, right. right, go introduce herself, make sure we are available anything you may need. So I was in, I was actually in greater contact over Norma's last uh, 13 months with her daughter who was now caring for her, you know, caring for her really for the first time Norma had lived on her own up here for all of those prior years. And um, it was, I I visited Norma twice when I, when I traveled down to Houston, uh, one in, once in February and once in November. And, and I remember her when I was coming to visit her in November, um, she said, I'm doing a lot of interviewing, you know, I've, I've got a lot of interviewing going on and I didn't really know exactly what, you know, she was talking about. And it was, it was in, in, in another conversation where I heard this, you know, the name of Nick for the first time. Yeah. He's, he's she's mm-hmm. meeting with and he's filming a documentary and he takes her out of the care facility and gives her cigarettes, which was a huge concern because even when Norma left Dallas, the doctor here said, Norma, no more cigarettes. You are so close that if you smoke, it will kill you. I, I mean, I was just reviewing some texts f- from her uh, from that first like, month after she'd moved into the care facility where she was like, I need cigarettes. You know, do you, do you know any, any way that I can get cigarettes? And, and I was like, Norma, remember, you know, what, what doctor said? Right. Um, and she said, what about those electronic ones? You know, can I, it, it, can I, are those okay? And I said, you really need to talk to your doctor and Katie. <laughs> um, but she wants, you know, she was, she had an addiction and she wanted to smoke. So this, this was very clear, clearly said by the doctors, if you smoke, it can kill you. And this is something that, uh, you know, that's what I was told that Nick was giving her cigarettes when, when, um, when he would take her out to, to interview her. So that was, that was disheartening. And I didn't know who he was. And um, I guess 
he's the one who said in the background for this documentary that he befriended her in April of 16. So certainly less than, less than a year before she passed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. at the, at the funeral, um, he, his crew was there. I didn't actually meet him personally. Final question. And just in, in just 30 seconds or so, um, you talked uh, to me and, and you've told the story now several times about um, your last phone call with her. Uh, do you mind just telling us what that was like? The phone call uh, or the, the, the last week with her in, in, in hot. No, just the, 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 just the last phone call, your last communication with her. There with her for that final week. Um, spent three overnights with her, just playing songs uh, for her, prayer songs at her bedside, and just sharing some holy moments together. And on the morning, and I, I, had, I had to leave to come back to Dallas Thursday morning, which was the 16th. And on the morning of the 18th, I got the, uh, I got the call uh, from her family that she was getting close. Um, they didn't know how long she had, but the hospice nurse was on her way. And um, the priest had come the night before, and he had also been informed. And, and I just asked if I could um, tell her I loved her one more time. And so they h- held the phone up to her ear. And I did. I told her I, I loved her and um, that everyone loved her. And in very labored breathing, her last word back to me was, love you too, honey. So that was that, was that, uh, that last phone call before she passed. I, I, there's, there's something else that was significant that had happened at her bedside uh, a few days earlier. I, I, I know I've talked to you about this in an interview, but that was when I had come by meeting her biographer in the hospital and he was the one who told me that she felt used and exploited by both sides and I had only ever heard her talk about having felt used by Sarah Weddington, Linda Coffey and so after she she was alert again the two breathing machine had been removed and and we could talk to her and her daughter was there and her granddaughter I I just wanted to I said to her Norma I just want to apologize to you and ask for your forgiveness for any pain or wounds that you may have any hurt that you may have experienced from anyone in the pro-life movement, any of us in the pro-life movement for all of these years. And um, we're sorry. So that was something that was very important for me to be able to do at her bedside before she passed as well. Well, Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to to share all of your memories about Normal with us. My my pleasure. She was very dear sister and friend, and and uh, God rest her soul. Uh, my first question is: When did you meet Norma McCorvey? I met Norva back in 1995, right after her baptism, and uh, been friends with her for 22 years until she passed. She came to San Diego. Uh, during the 1996 Republican National Convention, spent time with us and my family. She actually lived with my family for several months back, gosh, in the early 2000s. How did she end up living at your house? Well, (laughs) she was kind of a little bit of a vagabond from time to time, and she was living down in Mississippi and getting evicted out of her house there for not paying rent. Didn't know where she was going to go, and she was rather frail and sickly even at that point. So I just sent one of our truth trucks down to go pick her up. And uh, she just came to, to Wichita. She, and she was great. She was great with my kids. She, was, she loved my wife. Her, her daughter's name is Melissa. And my wife's name is Melissa. She, she called my wife Missy. And uh, no one has ever been able to call my wife Missy. She hates that name. But Norma was the only one allowed. So share, just share some of the stories. Uh, since the documentary came out, people keep on talking about this documentary as if uh, this was the real Norma and this documentary reveals who she really was. But this is a guy who didn't know her at all, uh, met with her a handful of times in the last few months before she died. What what was the real Norma McCorvey like? Share, share some stories with us. Well, Norma had a really uh, quick sense of humor and uh, could really cut you down like nobody's business, uh, would take on anybody, non pretentious at all. She wasn't pretentious. To, the idea that Norma could be told to say something is absolutely ridiculous for any of uh, us that knew her. If you told her to go left, she'd literally go right just to spite you and then laugh and look back and laugh at you. So she, really, she had a fantastic sense of humor and really down to earth 
Look, she, she liked to smoke cigarettes and drink O'Doul's. She loved to play pool in a pool hall. That was kind of her favorite spot. And just kind of shoot the breeze with anybody that would do that with her. And she would do it all day long. Uh, I, I spent so much time with her. We, uh, she, I don't know if you know who Bob Jewett was. He was our national spokesperson for Operation Rescue. He had the, she had the biggest crush on Bob Jewett. It was so funny. And we were walking through a mall one time, and she asked Bob to go into a Victoria's Secret uh, underwear store. <laughs> he was just red-faced by the time he came out. And him and Norma came out of the store. They didn't buy anything. I don't know. They, I guess they're just cracking jokes. And uh, I said, Bob, what happened? And he says, I, I can't even tell you what happened in that store. <laughs> we teased him about it all the time. You, you told me a story last week. Um, about how how guilty and how burdened she felt by Roe v. Wade. And because this documentary tries to sort of clip some quotes out and frame it as if she thought Roe v. Wade was a good thing, what are your what, what were conversations you had with her about that that shed a different light? So Norma was really broken up over the tragedy of child killing. She she held some of these pictures, these signs of uh, of, of, of aborted children and she knew exactly what it was that she did and and was just terribly broken up over that and like a lot of us i've become to come to the point in my life where i dislike january because that's when all the roe versus wade activities happen sometimes at the march for life there seems to be a little bit more festive of an atmosphere than i liked but i'll tell you a story there was one time her and i were coming back from a new year's eve party and it was just a family-friendly place. My kids were there. There was a lot of music and dancing and so forth. And she had a fantastic time. And on the way home, uh, she was just introverted and sullen and quiet. And I said, you know, Norma, are you okay? And this is New Year's Eve, coming home. She just looks at me with a straight line face and just said, it's January. And for those of us in the pro-life movement, we understand that. Right after Christmas and right after New Year's, all the ramp up for, for January comes. She would be receiving phone calls for speaking engagements. She, people wanted to talk here. People wanted her to talk there. And she disliked it. And I think that was one of the reasons she became so bombastic on her speaking tours and would literally just say the wildest things because she didn't want to be invited back. She didn't want to talk about abortion. She didn't want to talk about Roe versus Wade because she hurt so bad about it inside do you believe for a minute that her conversion was faked no not for a minute in fact there are multiple times where she would be literally crying and weeping and depressed for days on end over abortion and her name being on it uh, her her conversion i spent countless hours with her uh there, there's no doubt she was a broken woman Anyway, she had uh, a lot of issues early on in her life, you know, substance abuse. N none of that was a secret. Uh, but her conversion to both Christianity and to the pro-life position is, in my mind, 100% absolute. Do you know if she was conflicted at all about abortion? No, she thought it was horrible. She wasn't the most articulate spokesperson in the world. She didn't read vast volumes of books and so forth. For her, it was very simple. It's a murder of a child. And I'll tell you about the documentary. I can see, because I've been through countless interviews and right. on movies and so forth, and I can just imagine the question posed. I think the, the, you know, the gotcha question there was, you know, when, when she says, oh, if you want to have an abortion, no skin off of my, you know what? Well, yeah. I can just see the producer of that movie saying, hey, Norma, you're pro-life now, but back then when you were pro-choice, what would you tell people? When you worked inside that abortion clinic, what would you tell people? She would say, oh, hey, if you want to have an abortion, no skin off my rear end. Yep. And then they, that's the gotcha shot, that's the money shot, and that's what they put in. Well, I've actually... Well, I guarantee you. That. It's funny you say that, because I said that line before. I finished a book about the Irish pro-life movement just a, a couple of months ago, and one of the things I said was, like, the reason you know they were selfless is because... It wasn't their babies that were being aborted, so why was it a big deal? Well, you could clip that that sentence right there and say, oh, he said, uh, it's not their babies being aborted. Why is it a big deal? That's his position, right? Like, the interesting thing about the doc is you don't get the question. Even when she says these people are a-holes and and uh, they think that God has sent them uh, sent them to earth to save people, 
you don't actually ever get told who the a holes are. Like you don't know what the what she's referring to, what the question is, nothing. Well, certainly there are some a holes in the pro life movement. Okay, and I'm not going to name them, but uh, Norma was very happy to name their names, and she was very irreverent in in many ways to people that were supposed to be important, and she she would bring you down to size anytime she felt like it. And whether you were the Pope, a pastor, or just a person walking down the street, she treated everybody alike. And if you thought you needed some sort of uh, uh, recognition for who you were, that's the exact opposite thing that Norma would do. And she'd bring you down. And you know, she created a few people that disliked her because of that, but that was Norma. And she was just my friend. And I was just her friend. And we loved each other. She loved my children and my family. And that's all I was to her ever was a friend. When you saw the documentary last weekend, what was like, what was your reaction to it? Because, of course, in, in the days leading up to it coming out, every headline, New York Times, Washington Post, MSNBC, she got changed to, you know, paid to change her mind. I think it was a brilliant coup on Nick Sweeney's part to, uh, to do the rollout four or five days ahead of time to set the narrative before the documentary actually aired. And so when you actually watched it, what were your thoughts? Was that the friend you recognized? Did it make sense to you? Or what was your reaction? It, I I actually enjoyed most of it uh, because that's my friend Norma there. You know, as far as the, the the leading up to the release of that, you know, they say in the stock market, buy the rumor, sell the news. The, the rumors were floating around for the for the week beforehand, and it was just going to be this big bombshell. But for uh, the, until the last fifteen minutes of it, you know, look, there's my friend. A lot of old footage of Norma yep. and Connie, very nostalgic. There's some rescue footage. There's some. Uh, people, friends of mine that were on the clip that was just, oh man, I remember that. That was back in the early 90s or mid 90s or that was this or that's this person. So for me, it was a lot of nostalgia. And I just also missed Norma. I missed talking with her. Uh, you know, seeing a, I don't know, it'd be like my, my dad's passed away almost three years ago now and watching a video of him. It just is, makes you remember who they uh, were and how much they meant to you and how much you, you miss them. And so at the very end, the last 15 minutes, you know, they dropped the so-called bombshell on you. Oh, wow. Big surprise. She doesn't like Donald Trump. There's a whole lot of people that did particularly feminist. And she wasn't, you know, this neatly tight wrapped uh, conservative. Uh, she was her own person. It doesn't surprise me that she doesn't like, she didn't like Trump or that she was going to vote for Hillary Clinton. It, 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 it wasn't about abortion at that point. That was just about who she preferred. Uh, I wanted to ask you this question just because you didn't know him and you were friends with him for years, but what did you make of um, formerly pro-life, the Reverend Rob Shank showing up in the documentary, giving his perspective? He's sort of the guy that Nick Sweeney uses to confirm his interpretation of Norma's comments. And almost so he he plays sort of a very key role in in confirming the rumors and in the media coverage over the last week week and a half, the only evidence they actually have that that Norma was paid to change her mind etc is is Rob Shank confirming that. So what's your response to his role in that, especially considering that you knew him for years and still do? Well, the second piece of quote evidence would be her nine nineties on her five hundred one c three row no more ministries. Wow, gee, over twenty years she they brought in over four hundred fifty thousand dollars of of funds. That's twenty thousand dollars a year. So literally, she lived on nothing. But Rob Shank, gosh, you know it's hard to really go after the guy. I've been friends with him for twenty five thirty years, but he's literally nothing more than what he says about Norma. He's a paid actor. He raised at $1.2.5 million per year for his Faith in Action organization in Washington, D.C., giving out uh, Ten Commandments, writing books, speaking with the Supreme Court justices, stumping for conservative causes. And now he just has branded himself as a progressive, liberal, evangelical pastor that's going to put his stamp of approval on homosexuality, same-sex marriage, abortion, Joe Biden and anybody else that comes around, he's simply going to be that guy. And that, the, you know, the communists had a term for that, and that's useful idiot. That's exactly what Rob has become. Still my friend, so I'm going to reach out to him, love him in Christ, but he's become nothing more than a useful tool for the other side to give credibility, uh, so-called credibility. Well, there's, a, there's an old saying, uh, the ancient fate of traitors is to be hated by both sides. He's not going to be liked by his new so-called friends, and he certainly made 
enemies out of the people that were once his true friends. Final question is when you think of your friend Norma, who I know you miss very much, what is what is the story or conversation? What's the thing that comes to your mind when you look back? Look back over just our period of time together. Yeah. You know, I just really enjoyed her uh irreverent sense of humor, uh, her ability to quip little jokes out at people that would literally make you fall on the ground laughing. Uh, she just was a, a true friend. She loved children. She loved all my kids. I got a note here in my, in my desk here someplace. It says, um, gosh, what did I do with it? Doggone it. I should have pulled it out for the interview. It says, when I die, it's a note to my wife and I. It says, when I die, stuff me and put me in a museum. That was the sort of uh, humor that she had because she just thought that would be funny to see herself stuffed in a museum someplace. So, yeah, it's a good friend. Miss her a lot, but we'll see her someday in heaven. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing all these memories, Troy. I really appreciate it. You bet. Anytime, buddy. So first question is, how did you meet Norma McCorvey? I met Norma when she came up to Washington, D.C. in January of 1996, I believe. Uh, Reverend Shank was holding an event, a memorial for the pre-born at Gaston Hall on the campus of Georgetown University. And so, you know, we had heard about Norma. We had seen the baptism. We were thrilled. We were excited about her journey. Then Reverend Shank reached out to her, and that was, if you will, her first coming out at an actual major pro-life event. So it would have been uh, January of 1996. What was your impression of her when you met her, the first interactions? What were those, what were those like? Well, you know, I've been fighting the... Um, good struggle to end abortion violence and stand for human rights since 1973. So you have, you know, sometimes in any movement, you have the cause, if you will, and then you have the person. So for me, what was fascinating was distinguishing between the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade on paper and then the Jane Roe, Norma McCorvey, right there in front of me. And when you looked at Norma initially, she was just getting her footing, if you will. I think she was a bit um, overwhelmed because this would have been the first time that she would have encountered on a large scale pro-life leaders right uh, she was overwhelmingly uh accepted and loved but there's this kind of you could tell uh norma was very much emotionally overwhelmed at the event um it was a, a powerful time it was something that norma wanted to do and i think it's important for us to remember this point you have the conversion of Norma and the famous baptism scene with Reverend Benham. Nothing really happens on the stage for Norma for virtually a year. In other words, Norma was not coerced into that conversion. Norma was not pressured into that baptism. Norma was not forced into that. And one of my favorite pictures of Norma was coming up out of the pool with Reverend Benham and this massive smile on her face. I always tell people, look at the unscripted moments to know the real truth, not the pre-planned events or the photo op or what our news re releases say. This goes on both ends, actually. Mm -hmm. But look at, at those moments that happen without any planning, without any scripts, you could just see the joy on Norma's face. Uh, Josh Prager, who's doing a large bio on Norma, not by any means a uh, pro-life Christian, not pro-life at all, um, said that Norma's faith played a major role in her life for 21 years. And you could see the start of that. So 
the kind of narrative that Norma was, you know, blackmailed or bribed or coerced into the pro-life movement uh, wasn't true. It began in that baptism, that baptism service. And really, um, you know, Reverend Benham is an interesting person. I think looking at the, <laughs> the documentary, uh, you know, I, I think we were all both, um, you saw the good of Reverend Benham and the oh no of Reverend Benham all within the same uh, two hour documentary. But to hear Reverend Benham going and just candidly talking to Norma, to me, is probably one of the most beautiful moments in this entire journey for her, for the movement, hear this pretty solid fundamentalist minister who, had a, who has pretty strong views on different issues uh, and is not afraid to vocalize them, goes over to Norma and all of that kind of melted away. And uh, without sa sounding too crass, it was one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. But the one alcoholic had found peace and forgiveness and redemption through Jesus Christ. And he was sharing that with Norma. No politics, no agenda, just somebody sharing their story. And in its pure, it, it's so pure um, at that point, in just such an authentic and real moment, asking her to receive Christ, which she did. And so I think the fact that it was Reverend Benham doing that um, really touched Norma, that Norma wasn't too far gone. Norma was not a person who could never be reached. Norma was not a person who had this scarlet A, not um, the scarlet letter in, in the book, but of abortion around her neck but she was just a needy person who uh, was embraced and loved by Christ. So what are some of the personal stories that, that you remember of her? Because I've written a couple of articles on this, and one of the things that struck me is just that uh, the people who didn't talk to her just in an interview format, you had a real relationship with her, you had real conversations with her. So what are some of uh, your favorite memories of her, especially since she's been gone now for several years? Well, I, I think the thing that I loved about Norma, she was so real. <laughs> like, and you, you, never, you never quite knew, which I kind of loved, because you'd be at a pro-life event and, um, you know, Norma could really love you and be um, very kind and generous and other times be angry with you. I mean, for me, I was on her good side many times. Uh, this loud mouth, fun loving little guy from New Jersey, she loved. Then I was on the bad side of Norma. This loud mouth, obnoxious uh, little guy from New Jersey. The thing that I loved about Norma was there was no pretense to her. Right. There was no um, kind of glossy, manufactured person. You actually saw that in the documentary where she was unfiltered, she was herself. Um, this flies in the face. The joke was, you know, um, sadly, when Reverend Shank talked about we coached her what to say, oh, dear Lord, you couldn't coach Norma. I mean, Norma said what Norma said. In fact, if she probably felt coached, uh, she would go the other way. I think my personal times with Norma we're hearing her talk about two particular things. One was how she felt um, used by the pro-choice movement. Uh, she, she shared with me one time that, um, you know, she heard by a phone call that they won the Roe v. Wade case, that there was no relationship going on there. And one of the things she really liked about us was we embraced Norma. Norma was was happiest in um, was happiest. Sorry, I'm somebody's trying go. to call me here. Norma was happiest 
<clears throat> uh, in a pool hall, listening to music, and we liked hanging around her. Um, Norma liked being around children. And I can remember um, outside of these nice conversations that we had. And Norma was a really interesting person. So she got the reputation, I think, on the pro-choice side. They probably, they needed, if you looked at the documentary, they needed a, a, a plaintiff who was in need, who was struggling, but they would have wanted a 23-year-old, second-year law student, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They wouldn't want this challenged, wounded, broken house painter who didn't fit the narrative they wanted. With, with us, Norma was part of our tribe. When we were out there, there was no placating. There was no kind of putting our arm around her uh, and accommodating her. She was just one of the crew. And we were a fun-loving crew. And she was a fun-loving person. So she loved listening to music. Um, she loved hanging out. So those, those talks that we, we had, those, again, I'm going to refer back to those unscripted moments where you're just dialoguing. Then there were times, I remember, maybe my favorite picture of Norma is uh, Troy, Norma, myself, and Brandy Swindell. We were out at Troy's. There was a big, uh, Norma stayed there for a while. There was a big picnic, and Norma loved being around children, and she was just smiling and laughing. And what it hit me, we do, I will say this, not in a, uh, a way of abusing Norma or manipulating Norma, but at times I work on a wide variety of issues and causes. Uh, in fact, I was just down in uh, Brunswick, Georgia on the Ahmad Ar Arbery case. And I stress to everyone who was involved down there, the first thing we have to address is a mother and father lost a son, sisters lost a brother. For me, with Norma, it was never about her testimony or what she represented from the movement. I took great offense uh, in that characterization in the documentary because it was 180 degrees opposite from us. She was just Norma. And to realize that more important than causes or issues are people. People matter more than issues. And as a Christian and as a minister, that's been a foundation of my work and ministry. We must never get caught in a situation where we elevate the cause, we focus on the cause and lose sight of the personal component. And I can honestly say, I mean, if um, Reverend Shank has other people who he can prove that manipulated or took advantage of Norma. I, I never saw that. Um, the argument could be made, <clears throat> should Norma have been speaking at times in um, having to deal with all the emotions of being the Roe of Roe v. Wade? That's an interesting conversation. But Norma wanted to speak. She wanted to share. And those personal moments were the best. My fondest memories of Norma we're not at events, we're not at rallies, we're not at conferences. My favorite moments with Norma was just hanging out with Norma. Right. Uh, <laughs> whatever that looked like. And right. I got to tell you, you never quite knew what it was going to look like, for sure. So I know, I know you saw the documentary. So my last question is, what was your reaction after seeing the documentary? We had a whole week lead up claiming it said all these different things. Uh, the documentary didn't really say a lot of the things that they claimed it was going to. But because you knew her personally, what was your reaction after seeing it? Well, there were a couple levels. First of all, there's nothing but sadness seen actually on film, the pain and suffering that she went through growing up. Um, yeah. You kind of heard or allude to that. She didn't really address it that much privately with me. Maybe she did with others, not so much with me. I, I mean, we knew Norma came from a troubled past, but to see it condensed in that 15 or 20 minutes at the opening of the documentary just made you realize 
what she had to go through. In terms of the documentary, you always are concerned, oh my gosh, you know, how, how what impact will this have on culture and people? Uh, I felt if I was a pro-choice activist, it was kind of a disappointment. It wasn't the bombshell, the story's over right now, life goes on, uh, our movement moves forward and hasn't impacted us in a harsh, negative way. Uh, I feel uh, badly uh, for Reverend Shank for um, leveling charges against dear friends and a movement that were not uh, documented or backed up. And I think it shows an incredible lack of integrity on the documentarian. I mean, back it up. If things are said, if Norma was abused, how was she abused? And, and the funny thing that I joked about, here's the bombshell, you ready? Jonathan, mm -hmm. here's the bombshell. Norma McCorvey got paid to speak against abortion. Guess what? Pat Mahoney gets paid to speak against abortion. <laughs> yeah. Everybody does. Those, here's the deal. I, I, I don't know if they were being manipulative or they don't understand honorariums that somehow this bombshell, I mean, can you imagine what that documentary would have looked like if nobody paid Norma <laughs> to speak? Like, I mean, they took advantage of her. It, it was from... Yeah. Um, and they, the, amount, at, the, amount, the amounts weren't even that high. I know, and you know as well, pro-life speakers who make upwards of 10 grand for a single talk, 430 grand in donations to Row No More works out to, what was it, just over 20 grand a year, right? Like it's a, anybody who knows anything about the way any of these movements or organizations work would have thought that that was just a nothing burger. Well, the whole documentary was a nothing burger. I don't know if they were hoping it was going to be like a Center for Medical Progress kind of impact, right. which really did impact. I mean, it's now Tuesday uh, afternoon outside of Washington, D.C. There's no rippling effect in our movement. There's no damage control. There's no PR firms going, what are we going to do? It, it, it just was what it appeared to be. And that was a one-sided view. And this is what broke my heart. Norma has been an abused enough through her life. For these documentarians on her deathbed to abuse her and take advantage of her one more time was truly repugnant yeah. and, and really disheartening. Yeah. And um, I couldn't be more upset with them. Yeah. Well, Pat, thanks so much for taking the time to share your memories about Norma. Yeah, she was uh, a wonderful person. I look forward to seeing her when I get to heaven and um, she was, uh, she was beloved. Uh, that's for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a series of interviews with Norma McCorvey's friends talking about their friend, the real Norma McCorvey, what she was actually like. Uh, some of them spoke with her hours before she passed away. I hope that you got a sense of who the real woman was and that you understand that the documentary had a very specific agenda, a very deceitful agenda, but that the person shown in those uh, in that film is unrecognizable to those who knew her for decades and loved her for decades. If you want to check out past shows, head over to lifesightnews.com, click on the podcast tab. If you like this video, please do like it on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and head over to lifesightnews.com for any commentary. Thanks so much for joining us this week. We do hope you'll join us again next week.